with the first ceremony being at what became Arlington National Cemetery, but at the time it was the plantation of Robert E. Lee. Um, I think it was 1971 that it officially became a holiday on this Monday, and many people before that looked at it as Decoration Day, but the reality is it's to remember those who have given their lives and their families who have carried on afterwards. So I wanna remember the people who have made the ultimate sacrifice and those gold star families. Hey, who, uh, thank you for letting me in. Who carry on after the loss of a loved one. Um, I just found out that on Monday at 3 p.m. there's a national moment of remembrance so I would urge people, if you have a moment at 3 p.m. on Monday, to be mindful of, of those people who have sacrificed on this Memorial Day. So uh, we're going to hold this meeting the way we have previously, in that we'll have some updates. My district mate, Nader Hashim, is going to be here. Um, Senator White was planning to be here, but I think um, something came up with her husband, a scheduled uh, cataract operation from way back when, immediately opened up and I think that's what happened for them. We're supposed to hear from uh, Laura Chapman from the Put Putney Select Board, and then Ruby McAdoo from the Putney Mutual Aid is gonna give us a little report. And then as we have in the past, uh, if you have questions, uh, could you use the um, the chat box and we'll try and take the questions as they come and the other qualification is I think we we have this zoom time for the block of one hour so we're gonna have to be clear about keeping on 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 time here so with that I'm gonna pass it on over to my district mate Nader Hashim Thanks, Mike. I, I appreciate it. So I just wanted to let folks know I, I do have to jump off in about 20 minutes or so. I have to make a drive down to Northampton. Uh, my daughter's turning 10 and we have a socially distanced birthday party planned for family. So I have to make the drive and get there in time. But um, in the meantime, I'll be here for a little bit. I know we're going to have more meetings and you know, I'll be here for those as well in the future. Um, so for me, I've been primarily focused on helping folks with um, unemployment and the uh, PUA applications. There was an opportunity about a month ago for legislators to sign up as volunteers with the Department of Labor um, to, you know, we, we went through a few hours of training to handle these unemployment claims. And so we've just been going through that list and working with people, you know, basically from cradle to grave to make sure that they have um, all that, that they're taking all the correct steps in filing their applications and so on. Um, so that's, that's been taking up the majority of my time to be quite frank. Also the, uh, in, in judiciary committee, we have still been working on the justice reinvestment bill, which has been a project that's been lasting for several years before, before this session as well. And you know what we've been focusing on uh, is making recommendations to the corrections committee uh, regarding furlough and technical violations, um, as well as probation. You know, one of the big takeaways right now is that we're trying to get rid of. Um, oh, for those who may not know, furlough is technically an extension of a um, correctional facility outside the facility itself. So kind of like house arrest in a way. But a lot of people, about I think 71% of people were going back to jail for minor technical violations like going to work late or not being able to find stable housing and things like that. That's essentially the criminalization of poverty. And so, so, so we're trying to get away from sending people to jail, back to jail for things that they really don't need to be in jail for. Uh, so those have been the two, the two big things on my plate right now. And 
I'll, I'll go ahead and keep it pretty short there and pass it on so that you know, I can take any questions if any folks have them. Mike, how do I send a chat? Um, in the same place where you sent your question, there should be a, a line at the bottom for you to, to, to write something. Yep. Yeah, I wrote it, but do I, how do I send it? Uh, it well, it's sent, the, I see it. Okay. I see your Thanks. question and I answered it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. Can you answer but, uh, it on, do you answer these online? I, I like can do that too later on when we take questions. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> So one of the things I'd like to do very quickly here, um, and I especially um, want to do this for Tony Elliott. <laughs> um, the newest member of our county delegation is participating here, Kelly Tully uh, from Rockingham and Bellows Falls. And, and I wanted to share right now so we can have a conversation later on. Uh, I was talking with Tony yesterday about the governor's economic reinvestment plan to get things going. And he's very concerned with trying to help a restaurant get reopened in Bella's Falls. And I wanted to let Kelly know this because I'm sure she wants to be part of that conversation too. So uh, I don't know if you two have met already. I would assume you have, but uh, at a later date, let's try and get a conversation going to see how what we can do to, to help make those connections and, and, and get things like the restaurant in Bellows Falls open again. Thanks, Mike. Um, Kelly and I know each other. We're on mutual committees. Um, and I did write up something for you, but I'm taking some time to spruce it up a bit and I'll send it. And uh, I'll also uh, forward something to Ted Brady. Yeah, Ted's been a great help on a, on a lot of different issues, most especially with uh, the two different times we had to rebuild the general store, uh, Ted used to work for uh, Senator Leahy's office, and he now works for Governor Scott's office in the, the Agency of, of Commerce and Community Development. So, um, Kelly, we can, we can have a discussion later about, about that, pooling our resources, but I just wanted to let you know, Tony and I have been talking, and first thing I thought was we need to bring you in and if, if you have a second, would you want to say hello and introduce yourself to the group? Hello, I, as Mike said, I'm Kelly Tully. I'm a Rockingham resident and uh, everybody's been uh, super helpful answering a lot of my questions. Uh, I was sworn in in April uh, 14th and it was uh, the clerk of the house and myself <laughs> with masks on and, and everything, as you know, has been done on uh, Zoom meetings and and everybody's been, you know, very helpful as I reach out and ask about different committee work and, and they're happy to answer my questions because they're well versed and that we're all we're kind of learning the offsite um, process together. So it's been very helpful. And hi, Tony. Long time no see. <laughs> what committee are you on, Kelly? I am lucky enough to be on judiciary as well. And that's a great group of people, as you know, um, and they're very knowledgeable and they've been, you know, as far as the process are very succinct. Um, and I, I appreciate the learning process, certainly with that, that committee. It's a really fun committee to be on. We, you know, we, um, last year I was told that Judiciary Committee either gets all the most controversial bills or some of the bills that are a little bit more tedious. So it's, you know, it's like a pendulum. I like the, I like the combination of people. There are people um, that have law uh, enforcement background as well as lawyers and educators. And it's a, a nice mix of people that really bring a lot of perspective and look at it from many different ways. And, and I, I certainly appreciate that. I think that's one of the benefits of a citizen legislature is that we have certainly diverse opinions and perspectives that people bring to the to each of those uh, of those committees and and while we may not have expertise to start with uh, between our staff and, and the group knowledge uh, people are quickly brought up to speed yeah um, 
Ruby McAdoo, are you still out there? I am. Hi. Well, welcome. Thanks. Um, Mike asked me to share a little bit about some of the work that Putney Mutual Aid's been involved in and collaborating with recently. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of things in terms of creating a network and an infrastructure and communications with our residents so that we can kind of have a more robust, resilient um, way, to, way to communicate with people in the future. But the one thing that we've collaborated with um, Put Human Cares, Next Stage, the owners of the Gleanery Porch, and a sewing group out of Brattleboro. Um, we recently put up a mask tree in Putney, which allows uh, residents to get a mask without asking, without talking to anyone, seeing anyone. And we put that up today, Saturday. We put that up on Thursday in the afternoon. I promoted it on Facebook on Thursday night, and within 24 hours, the masks were all gone and the amount of reach and positive feedback we got online was really immense. So to, to us, I feel like that means a few things. And one is that we, we provided this service to our community at the perfect time. Brattleboro had just a few days before voted to uh, require face masks in establishments. And Putney did essentially the same thing just the night before on Wednesday night at their select board meeting. And so there may be people who have masks, but the mask doesn't fit well, or they have one mask, but in order to feel safe, they need another. And there also could be people who just didn't have a mask, whether they couldn't afford it, or they didn't find it, or they didn't know people who sew, or they didn't want to ask because it's sometimes it's hard, hard to ask for help. Um, so I think it came at a perfect time. Joyce Vining Morgan is a local Putney resident who has done an immense amount of sewing and volunteering with the sewing group in Brattleboro. Um, she also was kind of the visionary of this project and is the primary kind of mover and shaker and Putney Mutual Aid is, is helping her and um, making connections so that it can happen. So I do think that um, Brattleboro is planning something similar. It won't be, it'll be Brattleboro flavored. It won't be Putney flavored. Um, and Putney may actually expand and do different types of mask trees or mask clothes lines. Um, the concept came from somewhere in Northern Europe. I can't remember what country they have this concept of, you know, they have uh, nationally mandated masks and so they have free masks for the taking anywhere you can find them they're you know posted on um, signposts and electrical posts and things like that so this was our kind of interpretation of that concept there are other uh, mask trees in the country here and there but I think this is for our little town I think this has been really successful and you can find it on Facebook if you go to the Putney Mutual Aid Facebook page you can see photos and um, see the people who've made it happen now, ruby how many how many hits have you gotten on facebook about this post so far right so it's been less than 48 hours now and i think the last i checked it was in and around in terms of reach it was somewhere above eleven thousand people were reached and the reason for that is really that we, you know, we post it. We don't have that many followers. We're a new page. We posted it and then shared it to our local groups, I Love Putney and Life in Putney. Um, but we also posted to a Facebook group that is statewide called How I Can Help. And it's um, specific COVID-19 stuff. It's a great group. I posted it and it got a lot of traction. And so we've had 100 shares. Um, which in the world of Facebook, it's hard to really know what, um, what takes off and what's real because we have had a lot of, much more engagement with this post than some of our other posts, but it's, it's really, you know, we've had 11,000 people reached and 2,400 
2,400 people have engaged, which means they've clicked, they've shared, they've commented. And those are great numbers. And I think what that is, is a testament to what a wonderful idea Joyce Vining Morgan had and um, a great implementation, really timely. And um, it's a, a wonderful representation of, I think, what Putney Mutual Aid has wanted to do and what will continue to do, which is connect people and, f and fill needs as we see them um, and try to do it in a way that allows for <coughs> allows for all sorts of people to participate, um, not just not just reaching out to people who we think need it, allowing anybody in our community to self-identify themselves and make use of whatever the resource is. Yeah. So, if people want to help, are you somebody they can contact, or the at, through the Putney Mutual Aid Facebook page, or yep. is there any other way to contact? Um, if the, the best ways to get in touch with us are through the Facebook page, we have um, a Gmail account, Putney Mutual Aid uh, at Gmail. Actually, is it my, yeah, let me double check that. It might be Putney VT Mutual Aid and I need to correct things. But, um, and also to me, you can, anyone can reach out to me, Ruby McAdoo at Gmail. Great. Well, Thank you, Ruby, and, and thanks to the to the whole group. It's it's quite quite a grassroots effort that has come up, and these mutual aids are all over all over the nation, really. But uh, it's been wonderful to see the one in Putney that's that's grown and has been doing some some good work and and contributing to the effort. Right. Thank you. And and you're being a, a mom with two young kids that you're trying to homeschool, right? True. Yeah. True statement. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Ruby. Um, I'd like to give a little update on some of the work that uh, I've been involved in uh, for the House of Representatives. Now, we continue to meet. Uh, we meet. We meet remotely. Uh, it's been an interesting idea to do so. It's certainly. It's nothing like the real thing, but it has allowed us to do our work and slowly. It, we're, we're learning how to be more effective and I think efficient. Now the, the main committee that I work on is, is House Government Operations. And uh, we've been focusing on ways that we can help municipalities uh, right now. Most especially, we are aware that with uh, the economy on such a downturn, uh, this is going to affect towns, this is going to affect schools, this is going to affect local taxpayers. The, the concern on how this is going to affect our towns is we anticipate that with so many people out of work, uh, many people are not going to be able to pay their property taxes. So we've, we've given towns some, some extra considerations for how they can, how they can waive penalties and, and, and not add more suffering to people how they, they can defer payments instead of calling them late. But also the bottom line is the towns need their money to do their work. And then there's the contribution to the state uh, school fund. Many towns may find that they're gonna be in a position that they have to borrow money, that their cash flow is not gonna be where they want it to be. So working together with the state treasurer, uh, we've pulled together a plan where towns can go to the banks that they usually do business with, uh, borrow short term what they need to cover the cash flow until the revenues start coming in, but the state will pay the interest. So it's not going to cost towns uh, money to borrow when they have to do these short term borrowing. So we, we we're hoping that we can use the some of the federal money to cover those costs, but we don't want to make it harder for the towns to continue their work. Um, one of the other things that we're, we're working on right now is along with the Secretary of State, uh, how to keep our upcoming elections, taking into consideration, maximizing the vote, but minimizing the number of people who actually physically go to the polls. And the Secretary of State has been meeting on a weekly basis with Secretary of State's 
from across the country to figure out the best practices. And what it looks like is that mail-in voting is the best way we can address the health and safety of voters and the people who are gonna be counting the votes. That may come up soon where school districts have to vote on school budgets. And what we've done is we've given leeway so schools can do drive through voting where they can come in, get a ballot at one end of the parking lot, drop it off. Uh, drive in voting where they have a ballot that they've gotten in the mail. And then there will be some people who come to the polls. The idea, as we said, is to maximize the number of people who can vote, but minimize the people uh, who will come in and uh, have contact. The, the hope is that we have a primary in August, that we can do this similarly have as many people request a mail-in ballot, either from their town clerks or the Secretary of State, and then for the general election. Um, what we're trying to do is work out a deal where we can mail a ballot to every, every registered voter in Vermont. The idea, once again, is to ensure the health and safety of voters and the people who count the votes. And what we're hoping for is that the reality is if, if people from all across the state are gonna utilize this, uh, those orders need to start going in. So the printers, especially if we wanna use Vermont printers, can put their orders in for the materials they'll need. Uh, so it's, it's a long process and it's one of those pieces that, um, again, bottom line is we wanna, promote the health and safety of voters and people who are, who are counting the votes. We're starting to open up in Vermont in a way that other states wish. The stop the spread efforts have worked in Vermont. Vermonters have really selflessly sacrificed a good part of their, their lives to, to stop the spread. We've been very effective. Uh, our concerns right now is how far do we go? How fast do we go? And for a state that relies on tourism, how much do we really want to reach out and bring people from other states in? Now, there was a question somebody put about people visiting from out of state. Well, one day visitors are a different thing. We're not requiring those people to quarantine. Uh, we know that there are people who work in New Hampshire, work in Massachusetts, on the other side of the state. Every day they go back and forth. We're not asking them to quarantine. If somebody has a family visit, uh, we're not asking them. The challenge is for when people are coming from far away to spend a good bit of time in Vermont. And that's something that we're kind of working out as we as we move downstream on this. and. Uh, to his credit, the governor has been following the, the advice of the, the public health officials who, who know as much about this as anybody. So we're, uh, we're going with the science and the science kind of dictates the, the timeline on this. Um, last thing I wanna say is that uh, we're, we're, we're in a place in time where somebody said that these are historic times, we just don't realize it now, but um, I, this is another reason I feel great to live in Vermont. Vermonters have done a great job working together far and wide, near, near and far, that people like Ruby and the Putney Mutual Aid, Vermonters have come together once again, and uh, it's great to be part of this great state. So we're, we're gonna start opening up now for questions. And, uh, The Richard Orland puts in, we've got, we already have absentee voting. Yes, you're, you're right, we do. And it's just another way of saying the same thing. People can request that. And that's what we're asking people to do. There's two ways you can request a ballot from your town clerk or the secretary of state's office. Um, one of the things I, I well, would like to open up some discussion here too. We have several school board members here 
Uh, I think Ann Beekman is on and Jody Norman though. Uh, are you, you're not on the school board anymore, Jody? Okay. You certainly are as active as anybody. Well, we're running into a little bit of a, a snafu here uh, with passing school budgets. A lot of budgets didn't get voted on in time for, uh, for them to get passed and, and we're moving into where the, the new school, the new fiscal year will start. Um, Ann Beekman, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, would you like to update us a little bit on what the, the Southeast Supervisory Union is, is up to and doing? Sure. Um, we're going to be warning a vote for June 30th on our budget that we were not able to vote on because of the school closures. Uh, presently, because we don't have time to figure out big logistics, we're planning on drive-through voting. So it should be about as close to touchless as can happen. We have a budget. We're hoping people will support it. Um, I don't really know what else to say other than we were hoping for some relief so we would not have to do this, but we do. So we have, we're, we've gone ahead and scheduled the vote. So, um, Anne, is this the same budget that you presented around yes. town meeting or has yes, it changed it at all? No, it is the same budget we were going to present uh, at our annual meeting that may have been brought up at the various town meetings. So, has there been talk um, moving forward about how to address what might be diminishing revenues? We are busily identifying possible cuts. We don't expect anyone to like them if we have to make them. No, I don't. I, I don't suppose that that's something enviable. I know the state budget is looking at next year, um, possibly 20% less revenue. Uh, we have just concluded the budget adjustment for this year, and we we were able to uh, use our rainy day fund for this. This is uh, probably as close to what we can call a rainy day. But moving ahead, we're we're going to be looking at some, some severe overall revenue revenue deficits, and I think this is a time where we're going to have to balance the, the need for austerity with with uh, strategic investments to help get the economy going again. Um, so I'm going to backtrack a little. I have um, an, a message from Kelly Tully and she wants to add something to the to the piece on visitors from out of the state. Kelly? <coughs> Thanks, Mike. I did notice that somebody had a question about if visitors came from out of state. I think you really need to look at it the same as you, you're doing probably a really good job now, keeping your physical distancing to you know, six feet. It, it would be like somebody that you don't know at the grocery store, you don't know their, their necessarily their infection, um, if they are or not. And if they do use a common bathroom to make sure it's clean between uses, I mean, it just, it's really, I think, common sense stuff and, and that you just have to be super aware. And, and like if you were um, hanging out with them, of course, hopefully it's a nice weekend and you can stay outside and some of the fresh air can um, move some good air around. But just look at it from that perspective. And I, you know, as far as from a safety perspective, if that if so helps. wanted to add something additional to that just so you're aware I mean you're asking what the, the official policy is there's no sort of fine or penalty the state police aren't going to show up at your house if you're if you had out-of-state visitors and you decide to go out or anything like that so you know it's more of a strong recommendation um, for if, if you're coming from out of state to stay in Vermont to quarantine for 14 days. If you have family coming and you visit with them for a day or two, you know, just use common sense, which has been what has helped our numbers over the last several months anyways. Jody? I want to go back to 
to the school, Mike. <laughs> um, it's my understanding from watching the meetings on Zoom that uh, their vote is going to be on June 30th. However, it's unfortunate that the board is going to have to notify, I don't know how many teachers, but I think it's a, a real um, large amount of teachers. It's called riffing by June 1st. And um, I understand also that already um, administrators are dealing with um, recommendations for teachers who, who are worried about their jobs and are applying to other places. So it's really put us in a bad situation. We weren't one of the districts who refused to vote. We were one of the districts that had it set up two times, if, if I'm right, Anne, and, um, you know, and we would be really heavily punished um, with this whole thing. And I am hoping that something can happen. So, and I wanna know, um, you know, really more from what's happening up in the state house between the uh, two education committees. Sure. What I could say, Jody, to that is those those timelines are flexible right now. In other times, they wouldn't be. Now we talked to Lyle about this, and uh, if this were regular times, those those dates for riffing uh, would be pretty much set in stone, and that's not the case right now. So there's some flexibility there, and. And uh, we're going to suggest that there's some information going out, maybe from one person that's not exactly accurate. So um, we can follow up on that. But I would suggest you might want to check with Lyle as well, because when we talked to her, and the legislators just met, was it Friday or Thursday afternoon, Nodder? Um, they all meld together. Yeah. I think it was Thursday. I think it was Thursday. Yeah, we have, we had a special meeting just for this, and, and we had contact with Lyle, who um, shared that piece about flexibility with those with those dates right now. So, uh, is that meeting we, recorded? This was a no. This was a a conversation among legislators. This was this was a not a formal meeting. Because it's really hard for us to know what's really going on up there. Who's Lyle? Lyle Holiday is the superintendent down here. I'm sorry. Thank. That's a good point, David. She's if the superintendent down here, and I shouldn't assume everybody knows that. Um, briefly, what's happening up in Montpelier is that there's there was a plan to try and circumvent having to vote. Uh, it's at a stalemate right now. The House is wanting to negotiate. Uh, the chair of Senate. Education, Senator Baruth has refused to negotiate. He said, here's our proposal, take it or leave it. Ah. It's a proposal that requires cuts to all budgets. And we're not gonna go there. Uh, I think once again, Senator Baruth has shown he doesn't understand what school districts look like outside of Burlington. You're correct. And, and we're not ready to go there. That's why we're recommending people vote on their budgets. I think we have ways of making them safe, once again, for the voters and for people counting the votes. And uh, we'll have to proceed from there. Nader, I don't know if you want to add anything to that con piece of the conversation. No, I mean, I, I know that the school boards can also uh, have mail-in voting as well. And I, I think that's one of the steps that we need to take regarding that um, in order to keep folks safe. And that kind of bridges to the other question that I saw, uh, which I'm not sure if we addressed yet, which has to do, uh, <coughs> what can we do to advocate for mail-in voting in Vermont with bipartisan support and as the governor on board? Um, what you can do to advocate is send a message to the governor. Um, he's kind of taking a middle road stance where he's not really committing to one side or the other uh, 100%. So sending a message to the governor would be a good path to take. Uh, what else is there? I, I know there, I, I would say that there is moderately bipartisan support. I mean, it's, it, it's tough to gauge where people are, you know, from, from across the aisle when I'm not able to 
communicate directly with them the way I was in the state house. So that's that's kind of one of the many challenges that we're facing with being unable to uh, interact with folks in the state house the way we usually do. Um, and I also hate to jump off prematurely, but like I said, I have to. I'm already a few minutes late, but I have to head down to Northampton to get to Rowan's birthday party. Um, oh, thank you, Eva. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll let her know. I'll let her know. Um, so yeah, we're, we are going to have old? more. What was that? Ten years. Ten old. years old. Yeah, ten years old. Ten years old. And you know what? I'll show you guys the uh, chicken coop that we got. This is her uh, birthday present. Hold on one second. There we go. <laughs> See that? Oops. Yeah, that's the uh, chicken coop we got. So she got chickens for her birthday, and um, and now we're having some family over. We're all going to be socially distant and take precautions and all that stuff. But I'm going to zip down there. But it was Vermont. good seeing you all. And if you have any questions, I'm sorry. What was that? Only in Vermont, a <laughs> chicken yeah. coop for a birthday present. <laughs> exactly, and she loves it. She did. She didn't want anything else. I mean, she wants a horse. Yes, but gotta be a bit reasonable here. Wish her a happy birthday for me. Thank you. I will. Thank you all for coming to this, and um, you know, shoot me an email if you have any questions that I wasn't able to answer because I have to head off early. But you know, we'll have more of these meetings, and I'll be around for those. So, thank, thank you, everybody. Nutter. Nutter. See you later. Thanks, Nutter. It's my son's birthday today too. <laughs> oh, happy birthday! Oh, birthday to him. Did he get a chicken coop? <laughs> no chicken, no no chicken coops. He's and I won't even see him. He's in Colorado. So, <laughs> so I I want to thank Nader also. Um, during the economic upheaval we're experiencing, there's a lot of people out of work, and it has just inundated the Department of Labor and the uh, the system we have for helping people access unemployment benefits. Now, um, the legislators have been dealing with that on an individual basis. And what I would say as an aside, if you or you know anyone who's still struggling to get through the unemployment system at the Department of Labor, have them contact us. Um, legislators went to the governor and said, we can help, we want to help. And so we were all given a, a legislators only portal for us to help access information for our constituents. And then a number of legislators even volunteered to get trained to answer phones and dig into the cases for the Department of Labor. And, and Nader was one of those people. There were 25 uh, legislators who volunteered uh, to work at the Department of Labor and, do, and take regular shifts. So I wanna, I wanna thank Nader for, for going above and beyond and, he has been a, a great addition to the to the delegation here and to the whole house. He's a he's certainly a quick learner. He's a hard worker, and uh, I'm sorry that he's not going to be uh, working with us again after this session. I uh, looking to see if there's any more questions we have right now. Mike. Uh, okay. Yes. I, yeah. So this is Ruby. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to dwell on it too much longer. But I want to bring us back to the school budget piece because yep. I have a, a question um, sure. and a concern. I. It may be that this is all happening super quickly. So I had a meeting with our principal on Thursday, and you were having a meeting with Lyle at the same time. But I know that over the weekend there was a lot of concern from all of the principals that they were going to have to be preparing for the RIF notices that were going to be going out and those RIF notices were going to be ones that had a stipulation that this is all if there's a big if but they had to do it if I, I just want to I want assurance that the that our school board knows and so Anne you're on I don't know if the superintendent's been in touch with all of the school board and the principals but I, there's a lot of anxiety in our local schools around this particular point and I don't think it's just one person giving misinformation. So, Anne, yep. do you feel like you've, is that, have you been informed of that? It, it, no, I have not, but the last time I met with Lyle was on Wednesday, and apparently she met with Mike on Thursday. Um, as far as I know, they, that RIF notice on June 1st is contractually obligated, 
I don't know that the teachers union would grant any flexibility on it, but again, they are, they at this point would be potential RIF letters rather than actual ones. Right. You know, only yep. if we can't pass the budget, will this come to pass, but that will nonetheless lead to teachers at least trying to shore up employment by seeking employment other places. So mm -hmm. that concern is not invalid. Right. Yep. Um, we're doing our best to work with the union, but again, some things are already in a contract that was just ratified ahead of the pandemic. Yeah. Now for some, there's, there's a question, what's a RIF notice? It's a reduction in force. It's a, it's a contractual requirement between labor and the administrations that if there's a possibility that somebody is going to um, lose a position because of budget uh, contractions, then they have to be given be given notice. That's one of the concerns we've brought up with the governor when he put out his idea last week that he wants all schools to revote their budgets. Um, the logistical nightmare that would create is hard to imagine but the reality is that contractually you just can't do that uh, while we're trying to work within what we call unprecedented times uh, we still have to be fair and honor contracts so uh, right now i think what we're looking at is is going with the budget that was passed and then hopefully or the budget that was approved by the board that will be passed by voters. And I think the, the Rockingham Westminster Grafton district is going through the same thing. And, and um, I'm not sure if they have a, a date scheduled for their vote, but they they, they have to go through similar pieces. Now, you know, just, and just for the record, Lyle did not meet with the whole group. Lyle had, had spoken with several of the legislators that are part of our, our county delegation. We didn't have a formal meeting with Lyle, but that was the information that was passed on to us, that um, they're trying to work within the, the context of really unprecedented situation here. And uh, I, uh, I think that uh, as, we, as we move along, Next year's budget may look very different, and that's going to be a whole nother process. The mm -hmm. state, one of the state economists we use has suggested that um, it'll be four years before we get back to income levels as, as a state that we were at in January of this year. Um, I think that's why it's important that the governor put out his plan this, this week to help get the economy fueled up again. And I was glad to see that there was a significant amount of money uh, for agriculture and, and especially dairy. Um, dairy has a, certainly a special place in Vermont. And uh, while dairy farms have struggled over the course of last year, heading up into December, markets and prices were actually getting to the point where um, dairy farmers were able to cover costs. I think milk was going up between $19, $20 a hundred and, and production costs were around $18. And that's, that's not for organic milk. Organic milk has a different spike, uh, price structure. But the majority of our dairy farmers right now are, are, are not organic. The, the governor's proposal is going to put some money right into the pockets of dairy farmers. So I'm glad to see that's going to happen. Uh, there's also been a concerted plan to help a lot of the dairy farmers who were not uh, as involved with, with value-added dairy products like yogurt, such as with Commonwealth Dairy down here. So there's been some better communication. Uh, we're going to certainly need a lot of grease to get our economy going to where, to where it was again, and and I think that uh, we're looking to work work together with the governor on this and uh, see how we can. There's, there's a basic framework now, but there's there's no denying that uh, 
we're in for for a long haul of of some some challenging economic times. Now I see there's a couple of questions. One of them is from Alice Mays. Hi, Alice. And uh, Alice wants to suggest that we have a Bank of Vermont like the Bank of North Dakota. Now, Alice, that would be a great idea if we had the, the oil resources that North Dakota has to capitalize a state bank, uh, but we don't. You know, Vermont is, is a, a rather modest, of modest means, as they say, we're 23rd in per capita income, and we're right around the middle of the pack. And and to start a state bank, you uh, you would need a substantial amount of capital to get that going. And a state like North Dakota was able to do that since they have have those oil oil reserves that they have. Um, question from Richard Orlin is: What about tort reform and these are considerations that um, I think tort reform is a, is a bigger question than the 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 right here and now of of dealing with COVID, um, and certainly in the long term, something to to be looked at. The other part of your question is short term liability forgiveness. Now, Richard, can you? Expand on that a little bit. What you mean by short-term liability forgiveness? Audio. Unmute my audio. So good morning. Thank you. The the issue that I am concerned about is you know you talk about the budgets and the contracts with unions. Well, some of that is tied into liability and the law. And then businesses have a lot of um, liability if they open because they're afraid they can't get reinsured if someone gets sick if they walk into their business. So there's a lot of things that are tied into the fear that we have of this virus. Yeah. I don't know why, because it's a virus, but also that the legal component of this is such that if we don't change some of those rules and regulations, people are not going to be able to go back to business as usual. Yeah. Yeah. That, thank, thank you for that point. That is something that's coming up in discussions and uh, I, it's not, within the area that I specifically work, that would be judiciary. But um, I think that it's, it's in the conversations, it's, it's a concern we hear from a lot of businesses that um, may be a, a barrier to them reopening again. So it, it is part of the conversation. It will be a barrier and the personal injury attorneys are a very strong yeah. lot. So Ruby McAdoo has a question. Legislature voted to allow the Brattleboro Select Board to, to approve the budget. <clears throat> well, that the my understanding is the, the House passed that bill, but it hasn't passed the Senate for exactly the reason that your question alludes to. The whole question, I don't know if everybody heard, was uh, Brattleboro requested an exception so their budget could get passed without having to take it to the voters again. Uh, this was had to do with a number of things Brattleboro has asked for in a charter change. Uh, my understanding is that the House did pass that, but it hasn't passed the Senate. And part of the reason is it would open up um, quite a quite a lot of consideration of, you know, how, how do we do this and how do we make an exception? Uh, it's one of those things that we're gonna have to balance and, and not sure that uh, when the House passed it, we saw it as an individual thing. The Senate sees a little big, bigger picture. And uh, one of the reasons we have the input from both, uh, you know, the bottom line is we think the best way for these budgets to go through is is to get a, a town vote. And now that we have some ideas on how we might be able to do that and still ensure health and safety is is with the drive-in voting and, and whatnot, then that's the best way to go to get those budgets done. Now, ultimately, um, we don't want to limit voting. We want to expand voting, and 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 that's I think. No matter whether it's a school budget, 
a primary or general election, we want to maximize the number of people that can vote. Uh, any other questions? Well, I wanted to, Jody. Um, what is the best way to get to the chair of the education committee? Um, I've tried emails. Um, nobody on that committee has answered me. I've gotten an answer from one person on the House committee on what I've written. Um, they just seem to be in their own little world up there. And um, I'm a little bit- Are you concerned. talking about House or Senate? The, uh, the Senate is in their own little world. Um, and maybe not all of them, but the leader certainly is. Um, and he does dig his heels in and um, I don't know, it's hard. So I can't vote for him, so I can't vote him out and he's gonna run again. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you, we, we've had some discussions uh, as a group to try and figure out um, what we'd like to do is negotiate with him and he's just refusing to negotiate, so. Um, if, if you have a specific message and you want to email it to me, I'd be glad to try and forward it. But uh, I think House members can be, uh, have fewer constituents, so I think we're more accessible. Uh, I don't think that's an excuse for the, the chair of a Senate committee not, not returning. But I think this needs to be made public. Um, it's all happening without being really out there that this is what's happening. Um, I think it needs to be in every newspaper. Um, and I don't know whether you as representatives can do something like that. Um, it's, it's really difficult to sit down here in Southern Vermont and watch Chittenden County take over everything. Yep. Well, there's Vermont we are, and then there's Vermont. <laughs> we are working on it and uh, stay tuned for that. It's, it was one of the main topics of the conversation we had early this week. Um, Ruby, you had something you wanted to share? Yes, I wanted to um, make sure that everybody knew that Michelle Boslone was on the call and she's a candidate for the upcoming um, House election. And I was wondering, Michelle, if you'd be willing to introduce yourself and um, just say a few words. Do you think that's appropriate, Mike? <laughs> Uh, I think if you want to introduce yourself, we're, we're, we're keeping this to be um, away from the partisan political parts of this and just public service, but certainly just like anyone else, if you want to introduce yourself, that's fine. My name is Michelle Boslin. I live in Westminster and um, I would be happy to connect with people outside of this meeting uh, to talk about any number of different issues in the district. I am running for Nodder's seat. And I'd be happy to talk to you more about that uh, later. You can contact me in the chat with your email or um, you can look me up online, Michelle for Vermont, sorry, Michelle for Wyndham.com with the number four in the middle. That's all. I'll talk with you more outside. I would be glad to. Well, thank you, Michelle. And, and anyone who knows Michelle knows that she's been, been very active as a teacher. Uh, and working in various community endeavors as, as is her husband, Ron. And uh, we certainly welcome, welcome her presence here. Um, before we go, I just wanna go back to the place we started from here, recognizing that this is, this is Memorial Day. It's a rather somber and sober time of remembrance. And, I was inspired to share what I did at the start from uh, yesterday when we started our house business. We usually start the day with a devotional, uh, either from somebody in the community or one of the house members. Yesterday's devotional was given by Representative Vicki Strong. And she spoke to the sacrifice her son made when 15 years ago, he was in Iraq and he was guarding a polling place where Iraqis were gonna vote for the first time in their lives. And he and four other Marines were killed while they were guarding this polling place. 
Uh, they are now a gold star family. And they have always appreciated the service of others. And, and in this way, that family has given the ultimate sacrifice. I, I hope as we go forward into the, the weekend that with this wonderful weather we get to enjoy, we remember people like Sergeant Strong and the Strong family and all those families who have made that ultimate sacrifice. And the last thing I will say is that tomorrow at 3 p.m., Yo-Yo Ma is giving a concert that will be broadcast uh, around the world. And his concert, he'll be doing the six Bach cello concertos or suites, um, is to honor all the people who have sacrificed during the COVID crisis, the people that have been lost, and especially the people who have been lost who are medical providers during this time. So that's a, a wonderful way to commemorate those people on, on this Memorial Day weekend. So I, I want to thank everybody for coming and please feel free to be in touch if you or anybody you know has a concern and um, doesn't know where else to go with it. That's why we're here. And uh, have a great holiday weekend and we stay tuned. Nader and I will be hosting another one of these in the near future. So take care. Bye-bye now.